frankly, I'm, I'm nervous about what the market looks like here locally hmm. if we have another hail season like we had last year. Well, I don't really care about insurance profitability. Where's my cheap insurance? And I just want to buy my house. It's like, I get that, I do. Insurance companies don't just get to set their own price. They don't get to decide what their deductibles are going to be. To go from a regular standard asphalt shingle roof to a class four, about a thousand bucks. That's it? Can't wait to hear the comments from the roofers. Yeah, I know, I, th I think I'm pretty good. I check with them. The committee came out and specifically said, if we're not the most expensive product on the market, then we will adjust until we become the most expensive product on the market. Because they don't want you going there. For young professionals out there, maybe new to the business, everything distilled down insurance-wise, what would you give them? Hi guys, I am your 2024 YPN Chair, Kyle Wong with the Pikes Peak Association of Realtors. And I'm Nakari Wright, your 2024 Co-Chair of YPN. And this is our awesome guest with Elevated Insurance, Tony D'Alessio. Thanks for having me guys, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so for coming. Would you mind starting, we'll just get right into it if that's cool. I'm ready. So um, for those in the industry and those not in the industry know that there are a lot of tumultuous like insurance things going on well, wait, right now. Let's introduce yourself first. And then, that's a good idea. Well, good. That's right. a okay. good idea. Yeah, well, yeah. I want to make sure I know what I'm talking Sorry, about. I'm just just like, get yeah, right yeah. Like, yeah, I just they pulled me off the street. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm Tony D'Alessio. I own uh, Elevated Insurance Team, an uh, independent brokerage here in Colorado Springs. Uh, I've been an agent here in Colorado Springs for about 23 years. Been an affiliate member of PPAR for going probably about eight years now. Um, and I'm um, excited to, you know, share some, well, I don't know if I should be excited because it's not great news, but I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to be here to share some of the information, maybe make things a little bit easier for everybody. Yeah, we would really appreciate some clarity and a lot of insurance things. So sorry about that. You are, I'm just like ready to get ready. <laughs> right. like, excited. Give us some information. Uh, now, now. It's just there's so much going on in the insurance world, in the real estate world, in our world. There's just a lot going on. And so I guess, um, what are the biggest issues that you would want to address just right off the bat? Well, I mean, I think the most um, upfront issue that we're having is, is pricing, is, is the rates that we're seeing here in Colorado. Um, even historically, um, you know, Colorado for homeowners insurance has, has been usually ranking in the top 10 as far as cost. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that, of course. Um, like highest? Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, along the front range anyways, it, it's kind of funny what a house that you might pay $3,000 for here in Colorado Springs or along the front range, move it to Grand Junction is probably $800. And hmm. the main difference there is because it doesn't hail on that side of the mountains. It only hails on our side of the mountains. And what a lot of people don't realize is when one of those bigger hailstorms rolls through a population center, you're looking on an average of 250 to 450 million um, in payouts from that one storm. Um, you know, depending a lot on, of money. It is, it is. And so it's, it's hard for the carriers to turn profit here. And so they're continually trying to do things. Obviously, pricing is, is one of those things. Um, you know, this year has been particularly difficult in that area because anybody who lived here last year, um, it really anywhere along the front range, but in, you know, especially Colorado Springs, you know, we had multiple catastrophic hail storms. And, um, you know, there's, you know, with the inflation issues, supply chain issues, labor shortages, you know, what it cost to replace a roof last year going into this year, compared to just two or three years ago, is 30 to 40% more expensive than it was. And so that goes to the insurance company, and unfortunately that eventually gets passed on to the clients um, who feel the brunt of that, whether they actually turn in a claim or, or not. not. Yeah, so th that's why premiums primarily are just getting raised regardless. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a shared pool. So even, the, you know, like I didn't have a hail claim on my house last mm -hmm. year, but I took a 32% rate increase, you know, because everybody else turned one in. Yeah. Um, and insurance companies are, are still trying to figure out how to navigate um, correct pricing um, to where they can maybe try to turn in a profit. But last year, for example, and really the last several years prior, um, it's been about $1.27 out for every dollar they've taken in. Wow. Um, so Ooh. it's pretty, pretty um, uneven. Okay. Yeah. So they're struggling with that. Wow. So is that true for auto insurance rates as well? Auto insurance is not as volatile right now. Of course, they get damaged by the hail, and, and that's so much of, you know, somewhat of an issue, but there are people who, you know, their car wasn't where the hail storm hit, uh, or it was in the garage. You know, the house is always going to be exposed, and so if the hail hits in that area, you know, that claim is always going to happen. 
Um, and when they're catastrophic enough, then we get damage to decking or decks, siding, maybe windows. Um, you know, so it's pretty easy for those hail claims per per household to get to twenty, thirty, or forty thousand dollars. Or you know, if they have solar panels. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I never thought get, of that. Get really pricey. Well, even solar panels are really tough. If the whole roof was made of solar panel, we might be okay. But but it's an average of what I've seen through claims about six thousand dollars to pay the solar company to come and take it off, so that the shingles can get replaced oh. and then place the solar panels back on it. Are you so that's serious? That's an additional cost. Wow. Um, so they don't even get damaged. It's literally just the surrounding roof. Yeah, and they just but they have to take them off to fix the roof. Oh. And so you know that's a bit of a process. So it sucks. I, I never get thought up there of that. myself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, heavy. Oh. I don't know. It's sketchy. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. I don't know. I always joke with, you know, when I'm talking with people, um, because some companies will actually surcharge you. Or if you're trying to shop for insurance and you've had a hail claim on your record, that can impact you. And it's, it's a little bit silly. I don't know if they expect people to jump up there with a tennis racket and defend their roof um, <laughs> from the hail. Right. But... You know, I mean, there's not much uh, you that's know a normal so person funny. can do about that. Pickleball racket, dude. It's twenty. Yeah, that's true. I, know. I gotta, I gotta that. catch it up. I that know tennis is old. I think it might break the pickleball racket. That's so <laughs> funny, huh? Okay. Well, more specific to realtors, I know this is actually an issue I came to you specifically with, is coming to you for quotes for mountain properties or properties in. Uh, wooded areas or anything like that because it's my understanding now that and this has been coming down the pike for a long time I just don't think I personally didn't realize how quickly insurance companies would pull out But not even being able to get one or two quotes for a property if they're anywhere near any tree well, yeah, and and you know the the Marshall fire um, up in Louisville really Really scared them. I mean obviously they've dealt with fires in different areas California. We've had fires here and stuff but the unique thing about the Marshall Fire um, was, first of all, that fire occurred in December, not a time that you think of wildfires taking out a thousand homes. Yeah, um, it was not a wooded area; it was fairly prairie land out there. But it also hit at the worst possible time for everybody involved because we were at the you know lumber was trading at seventeen hundred, you know, yeah. per board foot compared to three hundred. Um, and you know all the materials were, were really high as we were coming out of COVID and we were having all of those issues. Plus, um, I think it was Boulder County that they're part of. It also changed a lot of codes, you know, uh, more green um, construction processes. And so a lot of people, and it was reported that it was as high as at least a third of those homes were underinsured because of those drastic changes in material costs, uh, plus the labor shortages, which makes labor more expensive then the code changes that go along with it. You know, so it was a very big problem, but you know, that fire is gonna to top out at about two billion um, for payout. That's crazy. And so that's as much as one realtor makes on their single commission. Yeah, I know, yeah, exactly, I know. Exactly. <laughs> I know. If I only I or could so get that, people say. If only I could get that license, I could, I could make that <laughs> kind of money. Um, you wow. know, so that, that started the process of them getting a little bit nervous about it. Um, but it wasn't until really about middle of last year where they were starting to see the hailstorm losses come through as well, and they're like, hey, we really need to slow down our market share. Okay. So it's a compound effect. It is. And, gotcha. And so a lot of carriers tightened up in the wooded areas and rural areas. Um, Fireline scores is kind of what we pay attention to in the industry. And that left about three or four standard carriers that were still willing to take on those risks. And probably about four or five months after that occurred, those carriers were grabbing huge chunk of market share in those areas, and they got nervous. They're like, well, we don't want that much market share in that high risk of an area. That's not smart business for us. Yeah. So then they tightened down, and it's become very difficult um, for people to obtain insurance there. And when they take rate increases, you know, we kind of have to tell them, there's nowhere for you to go. We can look at changing deductibles or adjusting some of your coverages to help with the price, but unless you want to go to the excess and surplus lines. Mm -hmm. Which is just tremendously expensive. And limited coverage. Some of them will exclude wildfire. Yeah, so kind of, kind of, kind of pointless. <laughs> You're yeah. um, You know, that they are, are better off, you know, staying put with where they're at. The, the, the local, the state government has, has tried to work that problem. And there was some, there was a statute, some legislation that was passed a, a little over a year ago um, to instate a fair plan program, um, which exists in a couple of other states, but this is the first time in 40 years that a state has tried to bring in fair plan. And it's basically guaranteed 
coverage. But I'm starting to learn about it. It's not supposed to go into effect until January of 25. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's ever evolving. So take what I say on that with a grain of salt because it could be changing. But it's, it's I mean, they, they, the committee came out and specifically said, if we're not the most expensive product on the market, then we will adjust until we become the most expensive product, product on the market because what? they don't want you going there. It should be like a last resort. It is, a, it is an exact last resort, but what the trick is going to be, and, and I'll be really interested to hear from you know, different uh, mortgage brokers and um, realtors, is you know, it's max coverage of 750000 on a residential. That's not a single property in the mountains that <laughs> I know. you're doing Yeah, maybe one of those old cabins, maybe. <laughs> yeah. That's including personal property and everything, so max, oh, wow. max, max coverage wow. of 750000 and it's ACV. It's actual cash value. It is not replacement cost. I don't know if that would make it through mortgage underwriting. Um, huh. So then there's discussion about layering. So then maybe you could get a standard carrier to oh. piggyback on top of it. But that becomes complicated. We, you know, stop me if we're getting too far into the weeds here. But, you know, so that product's going to cover fire, you know, water losses, you know, those types of things, all the things that other carriers are nervous about, but at actual cash value. So I don't see why a standard carrier is going to come in and layer on top of that with replacement costs mm. for those same types of risk. It doesn't quite make sense. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it, it seems to me to be kind of a flawed program at the jump because, you know, good or bad, this is not funded by tax dollars. This is funded by insurance companies. Oh, really? Yes. Even though it's a government stated thing. Yeah, they That's required it to say, hey, if you want to be an admitted carrier in the state, you need to throw some money into this pool. Oh. Really? Okay. I didn't know that's how that huh. worked. Yeah. Um, so you have a product that will somewhat compete with the companies that have to pay to fund that product. That's you know, I, That's crazy. We'll see how that's that like all... a lose-lose for everyone. Right? Insurance companies don't want to do it. The government's still screwing. They're no one screwed. has property insurance. And nobody has property insurance or at least coverage for a property that actually needs the insurance. Exactly. Right. That's it's, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm not sure honestly, how they're going to navigate that. I mean, there's going to have to be some adjustments to huh. be made, but okay. um, it, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's just been really unfortunate because uh, that's actually been a big leg of our business is transitioning from kind of the front range and going into more like retirement properties, people relocating from out of state, they're retiring, they want the mountain life, but they're not quite ready to commit all the way to Breckenridge, Aspen, whatever. They look for Evergreen, they look for Woodland Park, they look for Conifer, Bailey, all those cities. And they want something a little bit separate, a little secluded, but still 15, 20 minute drive to a main road or a shop. And that's actually why I came to you, exact perfect client that we're looking for. A lot of our business has been those mountain properties and slowly but surely, you know, oh, you know, State Farm no longer does this. Safeco will no longer do this. Great, at least we still got a couple options. And then just like that, this year, at the time of filming, it's May 2024. Um, but man, 2024 in the beginning started getting, ooh, I can maybe get a quote or two for you. And then... Um, you know, we can find something here and there, but if you really want the full coverage, you're going uh, usually surplus for a lot of money. Uh, and so that's been our issue for our team personally is like, this is going to seriously affect the market because not only are sellers, I actually heard this once too. I was at a, a friend's house in Black Forest and she's been in her home for 25 years. Neighbor got a non-renewal all of a sudden. Um, no claims, nothing wrong. Just, hey, we don't like Black Forest, which makes sense because they have had a fire there too. Mm -hmm. um, but Sellers, if they cannot sell their house to a buyer, right, or, or let's just say they lose insurance, then what do they do? They have a mortgage on the, on the property. What are they going to do? But if they go to sell their house and a buyer can no longer attain insurance, what are they going to do? It's going to completely stall the market. It's going to completely screw a whole section of people just geographically based. And I honestly don't know what a good solution would be for that because that's not going to help. No, no. Yeah, the fair plan is... is does not seem like it's going to be held because it's not going to be price conscious for most people um, yeah. where they're going to be able to afford that, especially with what they're giving up for coverage, you know, when they go to the excess and surplus lines market. You know, I don't, I don't know either. I mean, it, it, they're, the companies are trying to make some changes. And, and, and one of the things that we're seeing beyond the rate changes is they're adjusting some coverages and some deductibles to have a little less skin in the game or maybe put a little bit more ownership in the homeowner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and some of it makes sense. You know, deductibles have been low for a long time. You know, when I started 20 some years ago, an average roof was three to $5,000. Now they're $15,000, but people still had a $1,000 deductible. 
you know, so their portion of responsibility didn't increase. So in the last year, we've seen the majority, if not all, uh, maybe one or two that haven't done it yet, go to much higher wind and hail deductibles. Um, you know, either a mandatory 5,000, gotcha. or it'll be a 1% or a 2%, and, and that's off the dwelling coverage. So one or 2% off of a $275,000 house, if any of those exist in Colorado Springs <laughs> anymore, um, you know, is not there. so bad of a deductible. But, um, you know, that's not where most of them are at. Yeah. You know, so the deductible is going higher. And then they're also, a lot of the carriers are starting to depreciate roof, co roof coverage once the roof gets to a certain age. What is oh. that age typically? Well, it, it, it ranges between 10 and 17 years. Okay. Oh, okay. That's, that's not fair. bad. Yeah, there yeah. are a few. Yeah, average roof age in at least Colorado Springs, El Paso County is seven years. Yeah. They're like, next spring. That's right. what yeah. it's appreciate. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there are a fair amount of roofs. And um, the, the thing that's tricky is the insurance companies always don't do a great job of publicizing what that depreciation schedule is. Okay. Uh, so you're going to have this 1% deductible on your $450,000 house. So you're already at $4,500. And then if the roof is, let's say you're with a carrier that depreciates at 10, but your roof is 15 years old, you know, what percentage? So maybe they're going to cover 70%. So you're going to cover the other 30% on top of your $4,500 deductible. Ooh, yeah. And it's hard for homeowners to budget for that, to be prepared for that eventual outcome, you know, because they're not exactly sure what they're going to have to pay. So, you know, between that, you know, the deductibles, you know, the rate changes, if the carriers can get back to profitability, I think we'll see a lot of these other restrictions starting to lighten up a little bit. Hmm. Um, hmm. They, I, you know, again, I've been doing it over 20 years, and I have never seen a market like we've we are seeing in 2024, and nothing close. Been hearing that a lot. It's crazy, Unprecedented right? For sure. Yeah, it's it's. I, I've never wrong. seen and and. I used to joke when I would teach different classes or have different discussions and stuff like that that insurance companies are like a a big ocean freighter. They're really slow to adjust. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going off of data from 18 months ago. And in the like last... The government. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Slightly more efficient. But in the last eight to 10 months, I, I've seen changes mm. at, at a very quick pace where everything's fine. And then there's a bulletin that'll come out from a particular carrier that says, hey, three weeks from now, we're doing these drastic changes to our product. Wow. Um, I feel like you know, more than being slow, like that's also an issue because then all of a sudden these people who sign up for certain coverage, sign up with certain companies for a specific reason, now in three weeks it's like, well, that completely Different. changed why I signed with you in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and, and the other thing that I'm seeing, which is kind of new, it's not widespread yet, but a lot of times when, when, or when companies would change a deductible or certain types of coverages and stuff like that, it would only be for new business the existing clients would be grandfathered in under the old deductibles and the old rules. Mm -hmm. And I'm now just starting to see carriers make their changes for everybody. So even their existing customers are going to go to depreciated roof. Even their existing customers are going to go to that higher deductible. Um, just, I anticipate a lot of issues with that. It is. It's real fun at my office right now. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. It's especially fun for you having to make those phone calls. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, we, we try to be proactive on it and um, not people get blindsided. Because one thing I've learned over all the years as a, homeowner, shockingly, they don't want to read their homeowner's policy. They don't pay attention. <laughs> when the renewal comes around, yeah. it's not until their escrow gets adjusted, which is usually like, is five, six, seven, eight months after their policy actually renewed. Ooh. They're like, oh, wow, my homeowner's insurance went up. I know and that. It's, it's a poor experience. So we, you know, we're proactive prior to the renewal, letting them know what's going on, you know, and see if we can find anything better. And, and that's another point. You know, being a broker, I have a lot of access to different companies. And when I'm having clients take an increase, uh, like we're seeing in those 30 to 40% range, about 20% I'm able to find a better price for by switching, huh. which is not good. It's not? No. I feel like now it is. Well, maybe now. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, That's yeah. good. Yeah. Now. <laughs> Shows how bleak it really is. Yeah. yeah. Now. But, before. But the close rate before used to be like 70. Oh, nice. Wow. So, That's crazy. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's a, it's a big good. swing um, going to that. And it's, you know. Everybody's already paying more for groceries and gas, and and now yeah. you know property taxes went up last year, um, which was you know people are feeling this year, um, yeah. you know so it's it's tough out there for people. Yeah, and then pair that with utilities going up. Yeah, because mm -hmm. um, I remember when I I got the first note about my car insurance going up from 
what was it, 150 a month to 400 and then shopping around, oh, best we can do is 350. I'm like, wow, yeah, that's crazy. That's, that's what, crazy. That's, and no, no accidents, no claims, no speeding tickets. I mean, being a young male like that doesn't help. But. No, it does not. Oh, yeah, I have, so. Um, Only I've, time they can be this and it's okay. Yeah, totally allowed to do that. <laughs> when they charge you more. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you file a claim with, like, your car insurance or something like that, personal property, that affects your home insurance? It, it, it depends. There are a few carriers out there on homeowner's insurance that will factor in your claims history and driving record from your auto. They're still in the minority okay. um, compared to most carriers, but there are a few uh, that do that. Okay. So like in the very rare, totally random instance, if you go to a Planet Fitness one day, you're working out. It's a friend of yours, yeah. Window busted open, I just, I don't know, yeah. crazy. Yeah. And you know, you have literally everything in there, wide open in view. Should you file a claim? Is it the wise thing to do? I mean, the the it, you're going to look at number. It, it comes down to money to me. So, you know, the window is covered under your car insurance. Car insurance is a lot easier. You know, that's not your fault. You know, you might have a deductible. But that's not really going to have an impact on you negatively. Mm. All the items in your vehicle that were stolen, well, that's going to be a property claim under your homeowner's or renter's policy. And then that's a whole different world. So let's say it's you have a renter's policy, you have... $2,000 worth of items stolen out of your car that you can claim under your renters. You have a $500 deductible, so you're gonna get $1,500 from the insurance company. So when I'm talking to somebody, I'm like, okay, you know, that's not gonna cause you a problem on your renters. Even if they surcharge you, you're going off such a low premium, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be that much anyways, yeah. right? Okay. So it's not a big deal there. Do you intend on buying a home in the next couple of years? Because I'll tell you a, a perfect example. I had a, a person that was referred to me was buying a house up at Washington Park in Denver. Yeah. Beautiful house, million dollar house, and was getting some really outrageous prices. Hmm. About $800 a month for homeowner's insurance is what he was finding when Whoa. he got referred to me. I found a carrier that would do for $500 a month, which is still crazy, Insane. but he was excited about it. Then I ran his report, and two and a half years earlier, he Seriously? had that exact situation happen. He got $1,200 from his renter's policy for his laptop and a couple of things that were stolen out of his car. Mm -hmm. And the carrier that had that $500 rate would not take anybody who had a non-weather claim in the last three years. Are you serious? So then he had to accept the $800 a month. Oh, that hurts. Well, it hurts bad. Most people don't think about that, That's messed up. They just think about the instant scenario, which, you know, is not their fault necessarily. Yeah. Well, because no one associates yeah. those things nobody together. would think about that because it doesn't make sense that's what insurance companies do you pay this the money and then they this is not from personal experience yeah well, that'd be no crazy one so stupid that. yeah yeah and how quickly things change even if I was that person's agent two and a half years ago mm -hmm. I would have told him not worry about it because it wouldn't have been a problem two and a half years ago it came a problem eight months ago oh so my gosh you know so it's just you know it's hard to predict the future and what'll happen but I don't blame his agent that he had at that time who maybe advised him to turn in the claim or I don't blame the the client themselves for doing it because yeah. it wasn't a big deal back then but sure. cost him $300 a month for so basically cost him $3,600 because he has to wait until that claim gets old enough That's um, that he can switch really and get a different type of policy yeah six months and you that know time. what so when you're doing a deal like sellers will file a claim for like roof or something when the buyer asks them to so that's something we should think about now because pe people just advise their clients to do that and they yeah, do it. That's so, true. I don't know. It affects everything on the real estate side because if, yeah, for example, you have a client, they're listing their house, they have some damage on the roof, they didn't think it was bad enough, but the buyer's like, I want the roof replaced. Inspection resolution comes back. Hey, maybe you should just file a claim. You know when the hailstorm was, you know when it happened. Okay, yeah, good idea. Is that something maybe we should be reconsidering? No, I don't think you have a choice. And I think the way you really? guys have been doing it is the way that it has to be done. Hmm. It's in the best interest for everybody because here's the flip side to it. If they don't turn it in the claim, they don't get that damage repaired, unless the seller or the buyer is going to pay out of pocket. Out of pocket. You know, the buyer is never going to be able to turn a claim in for that damage because the damage occurred before they own the property. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Um, now, as it sits today, most carriers are not going to have a problem with one hail claim. Plus, the buyer will get some benefit because they're going to have a new roof. 
yeah. on the house, and that's going to have a pretty significant impact on the pricing for the policy. Where it becomes a little bit more sketchy is if the buyer had a claim. Maybe they had a hail claim on the house that they owned Left. prior no, two years just, ago. So okay. now there'll be two hail claims because insurance companies are looking at the insured and they're looking at the property and they're looking at a property that the insured owned prior. Uh, so, you know, I, I had a client, she, she's a real estate agent here in town and she had sold her house and had a hail claim on, did exactly what you talked about when the inspection came through, turned the hail claim in, mm -hmm. totally how she should have done it. Then the house she was buying had a hail claim on it. And so she had two cl hail claims in a 12 year period impacting her as she's trying to get a new policy. So that took away about 30% of the carriers that I can choose from, including the one she currently wow. had. Seriously? Um, loyalty doesn't matter to people anymore. Loyalty, I'll say this to the camera, loyalty <laughs> is a one-way street when it comes to insurance companies, especially these days. It, it mm. you know, years ago, I could advocate. I'd say like, you know, Kyle's been with me forever. You know, you're in a gray area in a claim situation or an mm -hmm. eligibility situation. Mm -hmm. I was like, Kyle's been with us forever, pays his premiums on time, doesn't have a bad claims history. You know, can we get an exception? And nine times out of 10, we could. Wow. Right. And then we get it done. Now, there are no exceptions. None. Wow. I don't care how great your story is. You might have me crying on the phone because it's <laughs> touching me so much. They do not care. That's wow. cold, man. Yeah, it's oh. cold. It's all about the algorithm, and the algorithm has no feelings. <laughs> the <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They have no feelings. Goodness gracious. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. That's it's, a little depressing. It's. I have nothing happy to say. Um, <laughs> awesome. At all. It's sunny. That's nice. <laughs> it's yeah, a nice day. Wow. But, you know, I mean, we've already had hail this summer or this mm -hmm. spring. Um, hasn't been um, bad, although um, I'm gonna, Yuma, I think, in the eastern part of the state had baseball size hail falling. Oh, good. They had to close the school because um, it got so much damage. Um, luckily, not a big population center there. So, you know, it won't be too impactful on, on the state as a whole. But, you know, frankly, I'm, I'm nervous about what the market looks like here locally mm. if we have another hail season like we had last year. Yeah. And there's no telling. It's not like, oh, if things continue as they are, it's like we could or we could not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we just don't know. You yeah, never know. You just, yeah, it's, it's, it's complete luck um, or bad luck, um, depending on how you want to look at it. But mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, there, there are a few carriers that have not pulled out of the state, but have pretty much stopped writing business. Gotcha. And they have told us, we're waiting to see how hail season goes. To Seriously? decide if we're going, and these are major carriers wow. uh, that everybody would know, um, and they're waiting to see how hail season goes. Mm. That's to crazy. decide if they're going to, and and a lot of the other carriers, you know, they've turned profit in quarter four, quarter one, probably turned profit in quarter two, or at least the beginning part of quarter two. So that's good, but everybody profits in those quarters in insurance for the most part. It's it's, you know, quarter two and quarter three, or the second half of quarter two and all of quarter three. We'll see. That really, yeah. So I, I would like to see, and I've heard they've done this in Fort Collins. I would love to see Colorado Springs make a code change mm -hmm. and make code at a minimum, at least an, everybody has to have an impact resistant roof. Mm. Because I think that could help us significantly. Now, if baseballs fall from the sky, it doesn't matter what kind of roof <laughs> okay. you have yeah. on, on there. I've seen them take out stone-coated steel roofs when they're that size. But wow. if everybody had impact-resistant roofs, it would take at least one roof replacement out of the annual, the, the regular cycle of roof replacements that we experience here in Colorado Springs. Yeah. And it wouldn't be a huge cost, mm -hmm. if any, to clients. Does that affect premiums? If you have like I think a it would, category four roof? Uh, yes, most carriers will give an additional discount if you have that type of roof. Plus, and, I, and I, I believe insurance companies would love that type of code change, but there wouldn't really be any out-of-pocket expense for the homeowner because most homeowners insurance policies, especially if they're built correctly, which isn't a leap in this particular in instance, has something usually called building code or building ordinance coverage. So if there's a change in code that makes a claim repair more expensive, there's a percentage of coverage there that will pay that extra money. Okay. So if we sit there and say on an average roof, you know, a roofer may you know, argue with me, but I think I'm in the ballpark, to go from a regular standard asphalt shingle roof to a class four, about a thousand bucks.
That's it? Yeah, it's, it's not, not bad. I've, I've heard it a little bit higher, I've heard it a little bit lower. Huh. It depends on the size of the roof. And Can't wait to hear the comments from the roofers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, 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 I think I'm pretty good. I check with them. <laughs> I see them. Um, but, um, you know, that would be paid for. The, the, the homeowner wouldn't have to come out of pocket for that. Huh. Um, so it's but nothing be, but upside for the most part. Yeah, and it's minimal. I don't think it'd have a very negative impact on homeowners insurance whatsoever. But in the long term, it could have a very positive effect because then maybe instead of going the average roof age in, along the front range of seven years, maybe it's 13 years. Yeah. And maybe it's 14 years. And that's significant okay. when it comes to those payout dollars. Yeah, when we're talking a couple hundred million dollars every time it hails. Mm -hmm. Right. Hmm. You know, that could really add up. So I'm sure city council is listening. State council, whoever he needs to be. Um, <laughs> the president watches this. Yeah, please. <laughs> Mr. Biden. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I would love to see something like that. I think that could be really impactful for us. Interesting. I wonder, do they have like a thing where the government and insurance companies talk and are like, okay, what's going to help you actually provide coverage? Or like, doesn't that seem like a good idea? Well, no, I mean, it, I <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to answer this pragmatically or... Um, a good idea that's probably why they don't do it well no they do do it it's uh -oh. just oh. i mean it's lobbying mm. um and they all have different agendas sure okay. um in the lobbying departments and and the government of 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 what they would like to see um you know for the most part with insurance companies they're usually div um, dealing with the division of insurance for their particular state okay? okay so what a lot of people don't know is Insurance companies don't just get to set their own price. They don't get to decide what their deductibles are going to be. Mm -hmm. They have to submit everything to that particular state's division of insurance, and it has to get approved, and they have to justify with their numbers okay. why they want to change the rates, why they want to increase deductibles, why they want to limit roof coverage at a certain age. Actually, did not know that. Yeah, most people don't. Yeah. Huh. And so yeah, every like, oh, insurance companies are like, well, I mean, we had to get permission <laughs> they to even do it. We don't yeah. just get to. You so know, it's they, very regulated. It, it's very regulated, and so that's why we see, you know, the issues that we've seen in California, in Florida. Of course, they have catastrophes there. You know, there's issues there. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, I've heard. Yeah. I saw it on you know YouTube. But um, what has been interesting to me to watch from the outside is politically, those are complete opposites mm -hmm. as far as states go, mm -hmm. right? But they have the same issue. And what it really came down to was those states' division of insurance because carriers were like, hey, we're taking these huge losses. We're really having a hard time, you know, staying profitable or even getting close to profitable. Um, we need to make some of these changes. And the division of insurance just continually denied them. Huh. So they weren't able to adjust, so then they just pulled out. So we can't gotcha. continue to do business here, so we're just going to leave the state. Because wow. they can't meet those regulations. No. Well, they say, well, you won't let me change my price. We're losing oh, money hand okay. over fist. We can't yeah. continue to operate that way. Okay. So we're just going to leave. Yeah. So, you know, luckily our division of insurance in Colorado has still been fairly good to work with. They don't give everything, of course, but, you know, they, they understand. And that's the reason Colorado isn't having the same issues as those two states because most carriers haven't pulled out. They may have slowed business, they may have paused business, but they're still doing business. Yeah. Um, and so as long as that you know, keeps up, then you know, that's a good thing for us. Okay, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, fingers crossed. I mean, the vision of insurance is not a terribly political um, part of the government. Never it's, even heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Interesting. it's under DORA. Oh, oh, well, then maybe yes. So are we. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Guys. Yeah, so we're, we're connected out. there. Marsha get... Waters, if you're listening. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we uh, we get our license under DORA as well for insurance. Oh, agents. really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've got to do our CE classes and, cool. and all of that kind of good stuff. So um, it, it's not like... Yeah, but everybody, and, and, and sometimes rightfully show, you know, all oh, these insurance companies are evil. And I was like, they have to justify everything. Yeah. Mm. And so they're very accountable, at least. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've had, I was at a conference with our um, head of division of insurance here earlier this year. And, you know, they, they understand the issues that are being faced to both the general public and the insurance companies. And they're trying to walk the fine line of um, compromise because yeah. you can't make anybody happy in this particular climate. Yeah, because I, I know a lot of consumers, probably even people listening, are like, well, I don't really care about insurance profitability. Where's my cheap insurance? And I just want to buy my house. It's like, I get that. I do. And it makes sense. But at the end of the day, you have to understand that these big, big deci decisions that are kind of an umbrella over us all eventually trickle down and they do affect us. They affect 
all of the things that we just talked about, including insurance, including being able to purchase a home in certain areas. And if we don't address these things before they become dire, I think once we come to those issues uh, and people literally can't buy homes, then we come up really, with really radical solutions. And I'd prefer to not do that because unfortunately, respectfully, that's when the government gets involved and that's when bad solutions are put as a Band-Aid over something that's bad. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about fair plan, so we can kind of get a glimpse of what happens when government gets involved mm -hmm. yeah. um, in insurance and what that can kind of look like. Um, and, and it's messy. And, and the funny thing is, is insurance companies historically don't make profit by they take in a dollar and they only paid out 80 cents, and so mm -hmm. that's their profit. Insurance companies really shoot for a break even. Hmm. Because what they do is they take our money and they invest it. That's where insurance companies make the majority of their profit. That's where they recoup their losses. If they're maybe a dollar ten um, out for every dollar taken in, they're like, oh, well, we can live in that area because we'll recoup it oh. in the market and continue to make profit. But they are insurance companies. They're not investing in like Russian equities or really volatile. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're in the bond market and stuff like that. And anybody who's paid attention, you know, the bond market's been a bit of a dumpster fire for a while. Yeah. Um, so that's part of the reason of the lack of profitability. Uh, Yep, huh? Because they're not able to recoup losses. I remember State Farm. He was the largest company in the country by okay. far. Um, I remember years where nationally they'd lose six billion, you know, paid out compared to what they took in. But they they made eight billion in the market. Gosh, yeah. So to them, huh. they're like, That's we cool. made money. Yeah. So they're huh. they're good. But those those days are not happening. Yeah. Right now and haven't for for a while. So now yeah. they're just having to play it a little bit closer to the vest. Yeah, so I know we've gone through a lot of details, a lot of the nitty gritty about uh, homeowners, car insurance, stuff like that. What are, for YPNers specifically, for young professionals out there, maybe new to the business uh, or in tangential industries, what would you say to them is like the big takeaway? How much do they need to know? Like what is everything distilled down insurance wise? What would you give them? You know, what they wanna pay attention to, and it, it, it'll differ a little bit depending on if they're representing the seller or the buyer. Um, you know, for those representing the buyer, especially if you get into a wooded area or if you're looking at an older property. Or you know, a log cabin. Log perhaps. cabin, yeah. Um, push that insurance objection deadline out as far as you possibly can without killing the deal, you know, so, okay. you, so your offer can still get accepted. Yeah. Because especially if they have to, you know, they really want the house and they're gonna have to dip their toe into that um, excess and surplus lines market, that's not a quick quote turnaround. Really? Why is that? Because most of us, we have to submit it to somebody. So I have to fill out an, a paper application. Well, I get to do it a PDF electronically, but I'm still filling out an application. I have to send it to the excess surplus lines companies who are going to shop it between different carriers, and then I have to wait for them to get back. They've had an immense influx of workload because of all the issues because that we just discussed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I talked to my person last week and I was kind of looking, you know, 72 hours, can I get it back or, or something like that? And they're like, said, I got a hundred requests in the last two days. Oh my God. So, you yeah. know, wow. I tell people now, it's like, it could be a week, it could be a week and a half until we get a number. Wow. So that's why the importance of And that's putting, just a quote. And that's just a quote. Yeah. Right. Um, also, and you guys probably know, you can easily find it in the regional building department, pay attention to the age of the roof. Okay, especially if you're representing a buyer, um, you know, where you know they're through the pre-approval process, and the loan process, they're, they're, they're flirting with their DTI limit, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Because a property that has a three-year-old roof and a property that has a 12-year-old roof, you can see as much as a thousand dollar a year swing in premium, okay? Which could blow them up and cause problems with the DTI and, yeah. and maybe we can play games with deductibles and try to get the premium down for closing and things like that. But of course, mortgage you know, company underwriters are kind of cracking down and limiting how high you can go on deductibles. Mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes it's just not possible. You know, so you know, those are the two main things I would tell them to pay attention to. Um, on the seller side, I'm a big fan of pre-inspections yeah. because um, especially as we get into hail season, if we've had a hail storm and the regular inspection is happening as part of the contract, you know, the odds of you getting an insurance company and a roofer out there to replace their roof prior to closing gets really slim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets, it, it can happen, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah. Um, so it's better to be at least proactive. Even if you just get your roofer to come out, at least take a look at the roof, if yeah. not a full pre-inspection. 
And in my experience, a lot of roofers like to do that just in case anyway. They do. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's really good for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, because the other issue that people are having to deal with that's new in the last couple of years is insurance companies, you know, there's a time limit to turn in a claim. So if, if, if that damage is over a year old, most of the carriers are not going to pay for it anyways. Yeah, mm. and which they, makes sense. And they, yeah, it didn't. I don't like it, actually. I'm like, really? if I've had my insurance with, you know, carrier X for 10 years, and there's hail oh. damage on it, and maybe it happened four years ago, oh. like I had the insurance. That's I, true. I think they should pay it. Now, I understand the bookkeeping side of it and why they, sure, sure. you know, don't want those numbers hanging over them for an, un, an unlimited amount of time or, yeah. or whatever, but I'm not a fan of that. But these carriers track the storms, and they will say, Kyle, you're turning in this hail claim. The most hail you had last summer was um, pea size. We know it didn't do this damage. That had to be from the storm three years ago. Like, wait a minute. What? Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they know. That's crazy. Wow. They know. And they, they are, are really cracking down. They are paying attention. They're oh. investing huh. in that kind of technology and software. Wow. And, you know, I, I try to walk a fine line because I do, I do lot, work a lot with, you know, different agents, you know, real estate, realtors, and, and what like that. And I never want to... I don't want to blow up deals. Yeah, of you course. know that that type of a deal. But especially people coming in from out of state, um, unless they're coming from Florida's or, or something like that. Um, just a little heads up on what they're expecting because it it you're going to have to do some babysitting after they get their quotes when they kind of go through that panic stage. Shh, it's okay, it's okay. I know, yes, exactly. You gotta, you gotta help them out. Scary number. <laughs> they'll go through the panic of, well, geez, I was paying $800, $1,000 a year. Now I'm looking at 3,200 a yeah. year. Um, can I work it? Is it gonna fit into my budget? Da, 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 you know? And so being a little proactive, not dissuading them, because it's still, real estate is still, in my opinion, the best investment um, that anybody can do. I truly believe that. I have multiple houses. I'm a big believer in that. Um, but, you know, just a little hand-holding, you know, in that yeah. area um, it might go a long ways um, to make it a smoother process for them. Okay. And I'm doing this kind of backwards. I'm kind of like working out the technical knowledge and the things that we should know about insurance and then getting over to you personally. But I am curious because I don't think I've ever asked you this uh, intimately. So what, what has your affiliation been with PPAR and then YPN as a committee um, from the beginning and, until now? Well, you know, it was kind of funny. I, I started, as most affiliates do, is just wanting to grow my business. And I was like, oh, referral partners, and I get more business, and, yeah. and, and da, da, da. And I, I started attending meetings and some different events, but I started in Realtac and, uh, you know, community relations, which is right behind it. And as I was sitting in Realtac, which I think should, if they can't make it mandatory, I think it should almost be mandatory for any new agent mm. um, to Why? attend at least a year of real tech. Because it's basically everybody coming together that has, that covers every step of the real estate transaction process. Yeah. And I have learned so much um, that's helped me personally with my own properties, talking with agents, talking with mortgage lenders um, about what everything that goes into that transaction process and what's happening on the inspection side, what's happening on the roofing side, what's happening on the insurance side, what's happening on the appraisal side, yeah. you know, all of those types of things. So I'm, I'm up to date constantly on a monthly basis of what's going on in every industry that has everything to do with that transaction. Um, and it's a really great meeting. There's a lot of back and forth, you know, friendly back and forth and, and a lot of education. I mean, I have been part of PPR for almost eight years and I still go to that meeting. Yeah, eight wow. straight years I've been going to that meeting, and it's still a value for me to drive all the way downtown, eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to be there. I'm bummed when I miss it. Um, and they I cater. Yeah, I love that meeting. Um, community relations comes right after it. I fell in love with that one because I think I was kind of looking to maybe do some good in the world but I didn't know where to channel it. And when I tried to look at something myself, it seemed too big or too daunting or too scary. And all that framework was, was right there. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. that's, and so it, nice. that's a great way to yeah. look at it. And yeah. it was a way to jump in. I, you know, I still put in time, I put in effort, mm -hmm. but I wasn't doing it blindly. There was people there to support me. I was supporting other people. And you know, I've been able to help raise money and be part of charities that I never would have had a connection with um, if I didn't attend that meeting. Um, you know, all the different events that get put on over the different years, all the people I've gotten to meet. I, um, I never would have considered leaving as a captive agent to become independent 
if I didn't have my connection to PPAR. I never would have felt, really? I never would have felt I could have done it. It was that successful. powerful. Well, um, oh. you know, so it was by far the best you know, affiliation that I've had in my 20 some years of, of doing it. And I can't cool. advocate enough for it. Um, but yeah, everybody should go to RealTAC and especially new agents. Yeah. Um, should really like just, you know, do six months. Just come and show up once a month. It's only once a month, first Wednesday of every month. You'll get value from yeah. it. Yeah, that's so cool because that's what I said, uh, kind of like what you were saying about YPN is you go in wanting to connect, wanting to grow your business and seeing what you can get out of it, how you can help. Uh, and then over time, you're like, wait, I want to give back. Like, I want to be a part of this. So, like, it's so nice being uh, a part of something that's bigger than yourself and then seeing hey, it's not so daunting when you have a group, when you have an organization going in the same direction, helping you be that outlet for channeling what you want to send out. Well, and what I love about YPN is YPN seems to do a really good job of walking the line of professionalism, but also kind of laid back. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you, can, you know, there's knowledgeable people there. You can really get into the details of some stuff if you need to learn something or you're trying to teach something to somebody, you know, and everybody's going to be right there with you lockstep. Yep. But... You can also crack a joke in the middle of it, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. it, and, it's, and gonna, it's not like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, there, you know, there's no hurt feelings, um, you know, or, or sensitivities and stuff like that. So I enjoy anytime I get to interact with anything with YPN because, like I said, I can really cover some ground. I can really learn something, but also not be real serious and joke around and, and mm -hmm. have a good time. So that's why I love YPN. That's cool. We appreciate you as that. our, our go-to insurance guy. You've sure been a huge do. help for, uh, I mean, us as an organization, obviously you you come before me actually, but also just me personally and like the insurance questions that you've answered, not only for my personal stuff, but for my clients, it's been a huge help. And so um, I appreciate you and I, I thank you for doing that. I'm happy to do it, man. I appreciate so, the confidence. Is there anything <laughs> else? I don't think so. I think that's all we have for you. I think we, I think we yeah. covered it all. We'll have more next month. <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah, there'll be new insurance stuff. I was going to say, yeah, there's probably going to be something gonna, in three okay. weeks you're going to be like, yeah. yeah, so by the way. Yeah, come to Real Tech. I'll probably be, you know, I try to share something new every month. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's good. I appreciate you guys having me here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so um, much. This was a fun thank, time. Yeah, thank you for being here. I'm sure this is super duper invaluable. Like obviously we have our veterans and like you said, like even our veterans, there's always something new to be learned. Uh, but especially like our, our new, our young professionals, our new agents, uh, people who are new to the area even, there are a lot of hyper local specific things to Colorado Springs, the Pikes Peak region, even to Colorado, right? We have a lot of clients that move in from out of state and you know, some people are like, oh yeah, I know. Some people are very surprised though. And so being able to have that expertise, that up-to-date knowledge and, and baby step, walk them through that uh, is essential, so. Well, you know, I, what I've always, you know, especially the last eight years where I've spent a lot of time around agents that, I, that I've learned is there is probably no better um, problem solver than a realtor, all right? There's, yeah, That's a high compliment. I, I mean, like, oh, I, I hear the stories. I see what you guys go through. I'm like, I don't know how you guys survive doing it, but you guys are just lickety split. You have a wide network, you know, that you guys will tap into if necessary, if you don't know it off the top of your head. And, you know, educating yourself. And, and what I try to do, at least on the insurance side, is try to get you to kind of transition from a problem solver to a problem preventer. Mm. Um, you know, because that's yeah. a better way to be. Don't let the problem ever creep up because you've mm -hmm. already addressed yeah. it. Um, you know, so a lot of the different education sources that are here through PPAR, you know, can help you do that. And I like being, I love being just a small part of that. Yeah, and then you teach classes too as well, correct? I do. I teach a CE class where I go into, you know, it's an hour long one where I really go into the nuts and bolts of all of this stuff and give a little nice. bit more detail on how agents can help advise their clients over on the buyer and seller side. So yeah, I okay. enjoy that. Cool. Awesome. We'll check that out. We'll make sure to link to it. Yeah, yeah totally. So, cool. Awesome. awesome. Um, yeah, well, thank you guys so much for joining. Again, Kyle Wong, your 2024 YPN chair. Nakari Wright, your 2024 YPN co-chair. Tony Alessio, Elevated Insurance. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll catch you next time.